Before we resume our study, dear friends of the Westminster Confession of Faith, let us seek God's blessing. Gracious Heavenly Father, Thou who art the light of light that lightens our way and apart from whom we are in absolute darkness, we do invoke the presence of Thy Spirit to illuminate us in the themes we study at this time under the leadership of these great saints of old who have produced for us the aid of Thy Divine Spirit, the Westminster Confession of Faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When we turn to chapter 9 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, excuse me, chapter 10, we really begin the history of redemption. Remember, Westminster has started by indicating that the Bible is the Word of God, which tells us about redemption, and then it describes the Word of God's description of God Himself and His purposes for mankind and how it all begins with the creation and providence and the fall and how God intends His redemptive work to come about through the covenant of great and the great mediatorial work of Jesus Christ. And in connection with that, they discuss, as we did in the last chapter 9, the free will of man. The actual application of redemption begins with chapter 10 and effectual calling, which we usually today designate as regeneration or the new birth. Chapter 10 begins with section 1, all those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them an heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by His almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by His grace. I like that especially, being made willing by His grace. Now, on the surface of it, that may seem to conflict with what we have been saying all along in the Westminster Confession view of the will of man. It's never made anything. It's never compelled to do anything. There's never any absolute necessity about it. And yet here we find them writing that the will, after being effectually called, is made willing. That again is a little point where I might have quibbled with them if I were there and saying, couldn't we find more felicitous language? Or if we're going to use that expression, explain it. Now, their answer may have been, we'll let the people who come three centuries later explain it. We'll just give them the language. I'm not sure what was in their mind. But when they say made willing, they don't mean forced to be willing. What they mean is that when we are enlightened by the Spirit and grace comes into our heart, then we find that light of God, which was before so repulsive to us, irresistibly attractive. And as we said before, the will of man is always a choice of what he loves. He always inclines to what he's inclined. He always prefers what he prefers. And now that he's made over again by effectual calling, he has a love of light born in him. And that light is now irresistible. And he's made willing in that sense. He's not pushed. You can't keep him away from it. He's a man of violence who takes the kingdom of heaven by force. He's the one who wants it. So he's made willing, not in the sense that he's compelled to be willing, but he's made over. And as a new creature in Christ Jesus, he's a lover of the light and not a hater of the light. Section 2 reads, This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether passive therein, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. I think you see now why I mentioned a moment ago that effectual calling is the equivalent of the new birth. 
The person is made willing. He is changed. And you'll notice the fathers here don't hesitate to use the word that the man is passive in this business. Just as when Christ talks about a man needing to be born again. That very figure means that he's passive in a birth, the new birth just as well as in the first birth. Nicodemus got the message, you know. He said, what are you saying to me? I have to enter again my mother's womb and be born? He confused the physical with the spiritual, but he got the idea of the passivity, of the fact that this was an experience that happened to you, not with you, but to you, not upon you, you see. Or rather than it's by the divine initiative, as the theologians would actually say. What else could it be? We're corpses. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We hate the gospel. No amount of preaching, no amount of praying, no amount of wooing, no amount of giving, no amount of serving could possibly make a corpse respond to anything to which it is dead. By definition, that's the case. Now, if it starts to respond, if the calling is heard and it's effectual, then one thing has happened. New life has been bestowed. And obviously, the corpse has not cooperated with it. The corpse doesn't cooperate with anything pertaining to life. It's dead. It's dead to life. So you see, in the nature of the case, it's passed. Oh, it's active in sin. Very active in sin. The thoughts and intents of the heart are only evil continually. Man sins from the moment he's created till the moment he dies, and through all eternity then, and so on. He's very active, but not to virtue. Only to sin. He's dead to virtue. Though so obviously, if he is going to be made alive to virtue, it is going to have to happen to him, and he will be as passive as a corpse would be. That's what our fathers have in mind there. Now it says in section 3, something which is changed in the declaratory statement to which we will come much later. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. So also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the Word. You see, as soon as you talk about effectual calling, the first calling is, of course, the external call, the hearing of the ears. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, and I'm a spiritual corpse and have no love for Christ or God or the light of the world, when I hear somebody calling me to that, I hear what they say and I don't like it. I'm not wooed by it. I'm alienated through it, and so on. So there has to be this internal call. I have to be changed so as to hear inwardly. The shepherd is calling me by name his sheep. But you see, I don't hear it internally without first of all hearing it externally. I hear Jesus is calling sinners. Everybody hears that. But I am a sinner. And when I hear it, realizing I'm a sinner, I know that's directed to me. Somebody else who doesn't think he's a sinner, say, that's meant for Garstner, he's a sinner, and other people like him who are sinners. They need that call. He's not calling me. I'm righteous, and Jesus agrees with him. I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. If you think you're righteous, I'm not calling you. I'm calling sinners. And if you, dear friend, as I, recognize you're a sinner, you are hearing this internal call. But you see, at this particular level, first of all, we have to be mature enough to be able to hear the external call and understand it before we could possibly experience it inwardly. That immediately raises two questions that this section deals with. What about infants who can't hear any meaningful external call? And what about people, though adults, who are outside of the range of hearing of the external call? The Westminster Confession addresses both of those questions, and it says about infants, some are elect. And it uses the term elect infants. 
It doesn't say whether that is all of the infants or only one. It just says there's biblical warrant for believing that some infants are chosen or call it, called even as infants. Now, our declaratory statement has changed that to say that all dying in infancy are elect. The original Westminster Confession of Faith neither said that nor denied it. It only went so far as to say there are such beings as elect infants. We, in the Presbyterian Church at least, some other churches have changed it the same way, believe that this expression should be all infants dying in infancy are elect. The second category, namely those adults who are outside of the range of the gospel, the Westminster Confession of Faith says those who are elect among them. Again, it doesn't say how many or how few. It just says there may be some, in which case God, who works when, where, and how he pleases, dispenses with the external call and deals as he would be in the case of infant elect directly with the heart. Section 4, others not elected, although they may be called by the ministry of the word and may have some common operations of the spirit, yet they never truly come to Christ and therefore cannot be saved, much less can men not professing the Christian religion, be saved in any other way whatsoever than by Christ, be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature and the law of that religion they do prefer, profess, and to assert and maintain that they may be saved, those who don't have the Christian religion. The original confession said a very pernicious and to be detested. Now that language was too strong for some later people who have modified it by the time 1958 was reached to say that they to say that they may be saved who are of another religion is quote without warrant of the word of God. See, the original language would imply it's without warrant of the word of God and indeed is very pernicious and to be detested. It's saying the same thing, but it's saying it in a much less vigorous uh, language. This is a kind of change uh, which generally has been made in the Westminster Confession. Not a change of substance, but a change of the vigor with which the substance is expressed. We have tended to recede from the more uh, vehement language of the original Westminster divines without receding from their fundamental position. It is still, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith in its latest modification, without warrant to believe that a person is ever saved except through Jesus Christ. The Westminster divines would say it's a pernicious thing and to be detested to entertain such a thought. The general principle is there's one way and only one way, and that is the way of Jesus Christ. 1647 said it very vociferously. 1947 says it a little bit more softly, but both are saying the same thing. There's only one mediator between God and man. There's only one name given under heaven whereby you may be saved. And there is no other way whatsoever. And we must never give anybody the impression that there is any other way. The originals would say it would be pernicious so to do. Now, that's a kind of a modification I wish they hadn't made. It is absolutely per pernicious for you to give anybody the impression that there is any other way of salvation save Jesus Christ. If anything, I'd make the language stronger to warn you against the terrible danger of doing such a thing as that. But even if you're offended by the original language and more offended by my language, this language doesn't change anything. It is saying you are without warrant. You are not justified. You have no right to tell anybody that there is any other way of salvation save Jesus Christ. Let's not miss the main point, even if we differ a little bit in the vocabulary used. Now we come to what Luther called the article or doctrine by which the church stands or falls. John Calvin called the article, the, the hinge of the Reformation. Even the Council of Trent recognized this to be the heart issue of the whole Reformation debate. Chapter 11 of Justification. 
Section 1 reads, Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins, and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone. I've often said when I've talked about this subject, it ought to be called justification by Christ alone rather than justification by faith alone, though I have to admit that's biblical phraseology, but what the Bible means and what Westminster is saying it means is all justification is not by anything in us, not even by our faith. Justification is by Christ only, not for anything wrought in them, not the faith that's wrought in us, or done by them, not the trusting in Christ which we do, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. When I have discussed this before, uh, some of you may even have seen some tapes where we have dealt with this, I have used a diagram that I once, I'll repeat once again to give you in a, grama a dramatic, a grama a diagrammatic form what the divines are saying here. The picture is this, faith in Christ brings justification plus works. What they were Denying was, of course, the Roman view, which is essentially this. Faith plus works brings justification. See, when they say this justification is not by anything you do, including the faith or the obedience or any righteousness infused in you, it's by Christ only, and faith is just a word for union with Christ. No efficacy in the faith. If you suppose that your faith saves you, you're in the same predicament with Rome. It's their works through faith which save them. It isn't your work of faith that saves you. It's that faith is the union with Christ. There's a reason it ought to be said, Christ brings justification by uniting you with him. And you notice how our first section here does mention that he's the one who produces the faith. But there's no virtue in the faith. There's no efficacy in the faith. The, faith, the efficacy is entirely in Jesus Christ. As soon as you bring those works into the picture, even though Rome says you must have faith in Christ, and justification is even by faith in the sense that the faith leads to the works, still the great Roman heresy that brought the fall of Rome in the 16th century and is still being maintained by her is that these works which you produce as a result of these faith is what is the basis of your justification. That is a pernicious error, a fatal error. The elements are all there, but to have them over here is an entirely different story. And the divines are just trying by that method to show you that these works, though they are absolutely indispensable, contribute precisely nothing to justification. The way I've always liked to say it, that publican who went up into the temple to pray and couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven but only beat on his breast and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner, about whom Jesus Christ said that man went down to his house justified. If he was 20 years of age when that happened and lived another 60 years of absolutely exemplary Christian life, was the model in the whole community of what a Christian ought to be, who was abundant in good works. And that man came up again at 80 years of age into the temple to pray. He would do the same thing. He would beat on his breast. He wouldn't be able to lift up his eyes to heaven. He would cry once again, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And while I'm on this, let me anticipate something that Westminster is going to say later. The Protestant deviation from the 
Reformation doctrine at this point, in its own way, maybe even more wicked than the official Roman view, which is this. Faith brings justification minus works. There are literally thousands and thousands of so-called evangelical teachers around the world in our day who are teaching that you can be justified by faith alone in the sense that not one solitary work follows from that faith and still you are justified. The Bible, the Reformation, the Westminster Confession of Faith say the works contribute nothing to your justification, but they are an indispensable part of it. If those works are not there, that faith is not there. If that faith is not there, Christ is not there. If Christ is not there, justification is not there. These people can't seem to get a certain principle through their minds which would flunk them in any responsible theological seminary. They can't get the difference between necessary works and meritorious works. These works are absolutely necessary. You are no believer and you are not justified if they are not there, but they are utterly non-meritorious. That's a whole error, fatal error of Rome. Nothing in my hands I bring for my justification. The evidence of my being justified, I come to Christ abounding in good works. Absolutely essential to a Christian teacher, and dear friends, it's absolutely essential to you if you would be a Christian person to understand that works are absolutely necessary and absolutely non-meritorious. To think they are unnecessary is fatal. To think they're meritorious is fatal. Justification is by Christ alone, and Christ is in us only by a living, working faith. We may move through some of these sections a little faster because some of the points I have just uh, in indicated are intimated more expressly later on. But section number two, faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ and His righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Yet it is not alone, see, it's not alone in the justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. Section 3 reads, Christ by his obedience and death did fully discharge the debt of all those who are thus justified and did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to his Father's justice in their behalf. Yet inasmuch as he was given by the Father for them, and his obedience and satisfaction accepted in their stead, and both freely, not for anything in them, their justification is only of free grace. That both the exact justice and free justification is only of free grace. That both the exact justice and rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. You see what, uh, I may uh, indicate this about creeds in general. The Roman Catholic Creed at the Council of Trent, formulated in 1563-64, states what it thinks to be the truth, and then it enumerates the various and sundry errors with, which are anathematized. The Lutheran Creed, the Book of, Four, of uh, Concord of 1580, tended to do the same thing. It stated the Protestant truths, which it felt were taught in the Bible, and then it enumerated the various errors. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith just states what it thinks is true, along with its indictments of the false, but it doesn't separately enumerate them. It doesn't say, for example, under justification, now these are the truths pertaining to this doctrine as found in Holy Scripture. These are some of the aberrations and errors of the various teachers down through the ages of this doctrine, and so on, so that it plainly indicates the truth and distinguishes it from the labeled errors. But nevertheless, it's doing the same thing. It is stating what it thinks is the truth, and if you're familiar with the history of it, you realize it is at this point and that point indicting errors without naming them and classifying them separately. Now, in a certain sense, this is the truth it's stating. 
Here's the Roman error, which it has also denounced. Here is the antinomian error, often found in Protestantism, which it has also denounced. What it is denouncing in this section three, which I have just read, is what we would today call liberalism or unitarianism, which fundamentally opposes the doctrine of satisfaction. You see, it indicates that the reason we may be justified by Christ is that he satisfied divine justice. Now the liberals have always said, the Unitarians, the Socinians of the past have always said, if there's real forgiveness here, if there's true pardon, it can't be paid for. And you Orthodox people are really contradicting yourself when you say on the one hand, it's salvation full and free, and yet it's paid for in full. Now make up your mind. Is it free or is it paid for in full? If it's paid for in full, it's not free. If it's free, it's not paid for at all. Now what the Westminster divines are saying, it is paid for and full and in full and it is free. But it's paid for in full by Christ and it's free to me. It's not free to Christ and it's not paid for by me. It is paid for and it's free but it's paid for by Christ, it's not free for him. He descended into hell for it. He bore the wrath of God because of it. He paid in full for it. But for me, I can't pay anything. I can only accept it. I can only say nothing in my hands I bring as long as I live through all eternity, nothing in my hands I bring. It's pardoned full and free. And my dear friends, if you are ever pardoned, that's the only way it's going to be. Try to pay for it. You lose it all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Section 4 reads, God did from all eternity decree to justify all the elect, and Christ did in the fullness of time die for their sins and rise again for their justification. Nevertheless, they are not justified until the Holy Spirit doth in due time actually apply Christ unto them. I've been pointing out here that the Westminster Confession of Faith, while it doesn't label errors as such, it nevertheless is pointing them out, and this is a rather modern one. No less a Reformed theologian than A.A. A. Hodge and Abraham Kuyper, two of the greatest we've ever had, one an American, the other one a Dutchman, maintained that justification was eternal. Now the Westminster Confession of Faith says the decree of justification was eternal, but justification does not come to the elect until the moment of effectual calling. Justification is temporal, though the decree is eternal. So it is even not only rejecting fatal deviations from the doctrine, but even a non-fatal but still unfortunate deviation that justification would be eternal. When as a matter of fact, you, my dear friends, even though you'll be elect from all eternity, are not justified one moment before you come to the cross where the burden for the first time, really rolls off your back. Five, God doth continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified. And although they can never fall from the state of justification, yet they may by their sins fall under God's fatherly displeasure and not have the light of his countenance restored unto them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. This will be spelled out more fully, so I'll just simply remind you that though we're perfectly justified, the guilt of our sins totally removed forever, at the same time, insofar as we disobey the Father, his sore displeasure is going to come upon us. Even though we are justified in Jesus Christ, that does not make us at all immune to the fatherly displeasure and to the severe punishments which he is pleased to inflict upon his children in the form of chastening. The chapter concludes with section 6, the justification of believers under the Old Testament was, and in all these respects, one and the same with the justification of believers under the New Testament. One thing I'll mention here before our time runs out, and that is this, uh, as a subtle heresy in our day of uh, thinking that we're saved by believing in the coming of Christ. I say, no, we're not saved by believing in the coming of Christ. Nobody was ever saved by, the believing, in the by believing in the coming of Christ. People are saved at any time only by the Christ who is to come. 
in the Old Testament, and again the second time in the New Testament. The Old Testament saints were saved, says the fathers here, by the same Christ you and I in the New Testament era are saved. We're saved by Jesus Christ. They were not saved by the coming of Jesus Christ. They were saved by Jesus Christ who was to come. That's a minor matter, but nevertheless very important to bringing home to us what's already been said. The covenant of grace was in effect. In the Mosaic dispensation, it was a covenant of grace and a legal dispensation, and people were saved by Jesus Christ, as truly as anybody in this audience is saved by Jesus Christ, and no one has ever been saved any other way. Then we come to this very choice topic. I think I even have time just to read it, and that's all I will say on it, because it is so choice that it doesn't need any comment, whatever. Ch chapter 12 says of adoption, all those, just listen to this, and I, I won't try to gild the lily, all those that are justified God vouchsafeth in and for His only Son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption, by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberty and privileges of the children of God, have His name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by Him as by a father, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. The Lord bless you.